the 2020 Aspen Center for Physics online colloquia today with Ibu Ba from Johns Hopkins University. My name is Henrietta Elvang. I'm a member of the Colloquium Organizing Committee and I was a co-organizer of the Aspen program Scattering Amplitudes and Conformal Bootstrap that took place last summer. For those of you who really miss Aspen, I'm bringing to you the view from the top of Mount Massive just so you can sigh and have that in mind. Now this year, the colloquia will be posted on YouTube at Aspen Physics, and you're invited to share this talk with your students and colleagues. The center is also hosting public lectures online on Thursdays at 5.30 Aspen time, and you're invited to join to that too. This week, Aharon Kapitulnik from Stanford University will speak on time reversal symmetry and unconventional superconductors. Since Ibu's talk is only 30 minutes, we won't interrupt him, but please raise your hand by clicking the hand at the bottom of your screen, and I'll call on you during the Q&A after his talk. Also, you should know that the talk is being recorded, so you may appear in the recording. And you can, of course, stop your video if you want to hide what you're doing while Ibu talks. I'll please introduce Ibu Ba, first year of Michigan, where I arrived as an assistant professor in 2009. And one thing that stood out about Ibu right from the start was his drive. He wanted to be involved, he wanted to learn, and he wanted to do research. He wrote four papers with his advice to you, and soon he started working with a postdoc in the group, Brian Weck, on some novel aspects of superconformal field theories. They went on to co-author three papers, including some with postdocs at Stony Brook, and here again, Ibu's drive to engage in discussions and collaborations was essential to getting things underway. These papers and all that Ibu did in this work is in many ways the foundations of this research program that he has continued to carry on and excel at. He has written some very nice papers on supercomponent field theories and holography. Ibu is a great physicist. With his drive and his engagement, he's really a role model for others. Ibu, we're very happy to have you here and we're excited to hear about your work. Welcome and take it away. Thank you, Henriette, for the very nice introduction. Uh, I'm certainly very glad to be back in Aspen, even virtually. Um, so so the, 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 the work research program that I will present, um, there are many, many people involved in it. So I'll be rather poor in, 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 in terms of citation, but give a sort of a, glossy view of, of what are the sort of main questions that we would like to answer and address uh, in, 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 in some more concrete way. So the title is very general, Classifying Quantum Field Theory, so I hopefully by the end of the talk you will take away, you'll take something away from it. So to start, um, by now we've known that quantum field theory has been the most successful framework for us to understand nature, model nature, or if you want to say anything very meaningful uh, uh, to then later on hopefully do some experiments. For example, we use quantum field theory to, to construct the standard model of particle physics, which is arguably the most uh, detailed model of the world that we have. Um, in condensed matter physics, we can use quantum field theory to study critical phenomena or just physics at long range uh, dynamics where you can sort of coarse grain over, over finite, uh, finite details. Even in cosmology, our bread and butter to understanding or modeling any phenomena in early universe is to use again uh, quantum field theory via inflation or any sort of initial condition uh, uh, question. Um, so in light of that, um, for something that is so fundamental to the way we uh, uh, interact to the way we sort of uh, commune with the world in, in trying to understand how nature works, uh, it is very important to understand what quantum field theory itself is, um, how does it work, what are the general predictions of quantum field theory uh, 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 at large, how does it behave in various sort of regimes, which we will try to define more precisely. So the central question, which in a huge swath of, of, of practitioners in high energy physics are, are thinking about is just the very basic question, what is quantum field theory? This subject, of course, um, you know, arguably quantum field theory started with the Dirac equation around then. So this is a rather old subject, 
However, still today, asking the question, what if quantum field theory is a very meaningful one, and we don't still have a rather complete answer. Uh, and part of this, uh, or most of this, is due to what happens when you have strong coupling. So we used to, in, 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 in start of grad school, to take uh, intro to quantum field theory, where we learn to compute Feynman diagrams, we learn to do perturbative analysis, we learn to do to write down a Lagrangian and try to uh, do some 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 scattering type computation. So that's all well and good. However, when we think about quantum field theories at the non-perturbative level in regimes where the parameters of the theory are not small and quantum effects are the dominant uh, things that, that, that determine the underlying dynamic of, my, of our system, we have a much poorer understanding of what to do or to even know how to make, make, make general predictions and, and, and say, say precise uh, things. So analytic understanding of QFTs and their phenomenology is uh, still an outstanding question in, 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 in more complete generality. Related to this, of course, is understanding things, something like confinement in QCD, which from a lattice point of view, we have a lot of interesting results. However, just having an analytic control of what confinement is in QCD, which sort of underlies a great deal of physics around us, we still, that's still uh, 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 lacking. Move forward, we also see very interesting emergent dynamics uh, when we think about various types of condensed mo mo matter models, the Ising models, the pot models, metal insulator transition, where very interesting dynamics occur when the systems are strongly coupled from which we would like to have more generic, complete understanding. Moving forward, um, the sort of state-of-the-art way of studying quantum field theory as a framework itself is to use supersymmetry in, in, in modern days. Um, and when we do so, we can construct many interesting families of quantum field theories, and these exhibit very interesting uh, dynamics, even though there is a lot of symmetry, such as supersymmetry. Um, and in many of these cases also, uh, you, we can find that some of the quantum field theories that we can talk about, um, we may not even be able to write down a Lagrangian described from short distance physics, so this is due to studies which use a string theory, which I will comment on, 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 on later. So, and even pushing even further, if you want to think about strong coupling limits in some quantum field theories, one of the things we find, for example, is the theory of gravity itself in what we call holography. So quantum field theory, just the landscape of, of, of quantum field theory, especially when they're strongly coupled, all sorts of phenomena can emerge from, from, from uh, confinement, which we very dearly want to understand, to gravity itself, which is morally very different from what quantum field theories are. But somehow, within the framework of quantum field theory, we can even have gravity emerge from, from such a feature in, in holography. So what all of these things say, of course, is that this is a sort of framework which we cannot which we don't know how to define precisely, how to define non-perturbatively, there's a great deal about this subject which we don't know uh, what it's about and how to, how to control. So this is a sort of a broad issue which raises the question, what is a quantum field theory? Okay. I will not give an answer today, but I will try to give a way to, 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 to even approach. Even at, sort non even at the perturbative level, at the level of Feynman diagram that we learned very early on. More recently, we found that scattering amplitudes, um, when you sum up over hundreds and thousands of Feynman, of Feynman diagrams for quantum field theories of, 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 of reasonable amount of supersymmetry or quantum field theory that involve graviton scattering, you find that there's a great deal of emergent structure after you find a way to sum up a large number of, of Feynman diagrams where the answers are very simple. Even at the perturbative level, uh, the question of what is quantum field theory is a very, very non-trivial question. And this is also a huge area of research in, 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 in modern life. So to get a sense of how we want to think about quantum field theory, it is reasonable to zoom out 
and think about what is the most general statement that we can make about quantum field theory after so many years of study. So this goes under what we typically call RG flow, renormalization group flow. Before to sort of define what it is, let's, let's think about an example that we are all familiar with. So RG flow is the sort of modern framework due to Wilson on how we sort of think about quantum systems and quantum field theory in general. So to give you an example, we consider ENM with electrons. So at low energy, which we're used to in atomic physics, for example, you can measure the strength of the electromagnetic force, which is given by alpha prime, it's one over 137. And the theory is a theory of photons and electrons that we can think about. However, if we just look a little bit around the corner, we know that we should include neutrinos. And this is the Fermi theory. So already, just around the corner from where we are, we know that there is something new that we have to include in our theory in describing the world that, that we see. And as you push further, let's say you increase the possible energies electrons can have. Let's say they can have energies close to the mass of the W and the Z boson. Then there are new interactions that, that this one has to account for, which are those that involve the W and the Z boson. And that actually sort of renormalizes the, 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 the electromagnetic coupling to now 1 over 128. And even if you push further at the energy in your system, you at, you, you, you at some point start to see the Higgs uh, boson, which comes in, which we detected a few years ago. Um, and you push even further, then you have electroweak unification, where both the Higgs and the W themselves become massless. So just starting with a single theory of electrons, and as we sort of study nature at higher and higher energy, we find that the actual theory itself is changing, right? Although we have one description of nature, but the theory seems to depend on at which energy I am probing it and, 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 and studying it. So the, 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 the sort of a summary of this is that the particle content and the strength of forces in nature change as a function of energy. You cannot just ignore the energy scale that, at, at which you're, you're, you're in. And the sort of colloquial statement is that uh, as you go to higher energies, you're probing very, very short distance aspects of nature. And the, the, the statement is high energy particles will probe short distance physics, whereas low energy particles probe long distance, long, long distance physics. So in a sense, when I tell you I have a quantum field theory, there is always this fifth direction, which from which the theory changed and emerged, and there is a sort of meaningful dynamic along the fifth direction, which goes under the umbrella name of renormalization group flow. So this is the most modern way of how we want to think about quantum field theory and, and, and quantum systems in, in general. So to, 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 to sort of summarize this, uh, typically when we say we have a quantum field theory or quantum system, you have what we usually call the free limit, where you have elementary particles uh, such as electrons, quarks, and, and, and however much you want. This could be, for example, a lattice of atoms from which you can have a collection of electrons that sit on. And then the next thing that happens is you turn on, you turn on some interactions. For example, if you, have a theory just in, if you have a theory in atomic physics where you have a collection of electrons, you, you, have, an, you have an interaction, which is the Coulomb force that you, that you, that, that you turn on which initially is small, which allows you to both think about electrons as individual things, but also interacting in a very, very specific way from which you can then try to understand the dynamic. But of course, those things can become very strongly coupled and the very notion of the electron itself can lose meaning and you have emergent dynamics and new phases of matter emerge into your system. Uh, and this typically happens when we look at the theory as long distances not at the very short distance of, of the electrons. And this is what we call coarse graining our system. So roughly, we have these three regimes of quantum field theory that we wish to think about. You have uh, what we typically call the UV, where you tell me some initial uh, basic information about your system. 
you have then a perturbative regime where you turn on small interactions and you let it run. And then under the dynamics of a renormalization group flow, those parameters that you turn on, they, they grow, they become quantum corrected and they change and they can be large. And once they large, you are in a new regime of your system, which we typically call strongly coupled phases and all sorts of interesting things can happen in, 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 in those cases, but we, we don't have a very strong uh, control on, on, on how to study those. So uh, a little less sort of cartoony picture is you can think about, when we think about a quantum field theory, even after I tell you the short distance uh, uh, degree of freedom, um, there is a space associated with it, and this is what we call the space of coupling. And uh, along the space of coupling, when you sort of deform the theory in some way, when you turn on any one of these parameters, you set off a flow, and the flow will go from one point, which you, we, we will call some UV fixed point, and flow down to some other point, which we will call the infrared fixed point. And along such a flow, the physical parameters are changing, masses are changing, coupling parameters are changing, the strength of the force um, of the forces are changing, and they and new 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 dynamics can emerge, and new new descriptions are needed depending on 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 where you are. So. Um, an interesting observation, however, here is that even though we call this sort of a flow the quantum field theory, there are these fixed points over here. There is a sort of a start and a finish. Already, the sort of starts that we just talked about is just free particles. But then you can have an end point fixed point, which is going to be some interacting theory from which the which does not flow anymore. The theory just ends. So this class of, of, of theories, these fixed points, which gives you the beginning and end points of quantum field theory are these flows, we call those conformal field theory. And the term conformal field theory is exactly as you think. Uh, the, the quantum theory is scale invariant, meaning that it is insensitive to which energy scale you, you put it. You can take that quantum field theory and, and put it at energy energy scale, it will always look the same. The, para the, the theory isn't running. The parameters of the theory aren't running. Um, the operators in the theory are, 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 are there. Um, and, and you can study at any energy scale. Um, and we call those uh, uh, conformal to a theory, and they define the sort of beginning and end point of, of renormalization group work. So if we want to now characterize the space of, of quantum field theories, what we would like to do then is instead of trying to study this whole beast, what you can do is characterize all the possible beginning and end points that you can have. What are all the possible quantum field theory, conformal field theories that, that exist? What are, and how can you characterize all the different conformal field theories that exist out there? From the point of view, from this point of view of starting with conformal field theory, <coughs> the, to characterize the rest of the space of quantum field theory, you tell me all the possible conformal field theory, and then once you tell me that, you want to tell me all the possible ways you can deform those conformal field theories and set off these uh, RG flows, which then define a, a, a quantum field theory. So here, when we say deformation, Deformations morally is what we think about as adding interaction. And one of the more common deformations you can do for quantum field theory, one of the, uh, is adding a force of interaction. Adding a force of interaction, you should think of as actually doing a deformation. When you have a theory of, let's say, um, if you consider a simple example of, of writing down a Lagrangian, what we're, what we're starting there, we're starting with a conformal field theory, which is made of massless fermions and massless scalar fields, and we can add interaction. When we gauge, for example, the symmetry for fermions and scalars, what we're doing is we're adding a specific interaction, and this, is, this interaction is what we typically call the force, and we have gauge fields, which we call force carriers. You could also add Yukawa couplings, which are more things that, 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 that allow the interaction between massless fermions and, 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 and scalars and, and so on. So that is, so in this very precise way, 
we can think about this UV fixed point of a free theory as being a conformal theory. Okay. In general, however, CFTs are going to be some interacting quantum field theory. And the way you characterize them is exactly by conformal symmetry. So these quantum field theories enjoy a larger symmetry than just the Lorentz symmetry. So all quantum field theories enjoy Lorentz symmetry and, and, and it is the underlying symmetry that, that tells you, that, that, that controls the dynamic of the system. Conformal field theories, in addition to Lorentz symmetry, enjoy an additional space-time symmetry, which is con local conformal trans, which is conformal transformation, which you can think of as local scale invariant. Meaning, locally, wherever I am in my space, I can sort of locally rescale my space and, and and time, for that matter. But the quantum system is invariant under such a local 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 scale scaling that, that, that you that you can do so this larger symmetry actually is very very constraining in fact um, you can show that if you have a conformal symmetry you obtain what we what's, what's called the bootstrap equation which is an infinite set of consistency equations that must be satisfied by all um, uh, conformal field theories and if you you're able to solve all of those uh, consistency equations, then you would have classified all possible uh, uh, CFTs that can exist. However, this is, of course, a very hard problem, and this is a subject also to a great deal of research uh, today. I will not describe, discuss this approach in this, in this talk here. However, I will, I will try to describe another approach. So with this picture in mind, um, really, when we say we have a quantum field theory, what you should have in mind is Aspen in this way. You have basically many peaks, mountains, and along these mountains, you have all of these paths, which you can think of as flows, various sort of RG flows, which can flow from one sort of a peak to another peak. You can flow to, for example, valleys, which are very wide and large just to describe the family of conformal field theories that are related by some continuous uh, parameters. You can have sort of hidden valleys that are very hard to access. You can, you can think of all of these different peaks as sort of different Lagrangian models of, 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 of quantum field theories from which you have all sorts of deformation that can lead to all sorts of interesting things. So this picture is not entirely incorrect. It is actually a pretty sort of accurate picture of how we think about the space of quantum field theory. What you would like to do is to figure out what are all of the peaks are. And then once you understand them, you want to understand what are all the different paths that connect different valleys and different peaks and different um, sort of local uh, maxima and, 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 and such. As you can see, of course, this is a much more complicated, harder problem. Just knowing all the peaks is not going to be enough to, to say everything you want to say about quantum field theory. You need to figure out what all the peaks are, which are the conformal field theories, and then understand all the different deformations that you can do uh, for the conformal field theories to go to various different directions to understand the various different tracks, which gives you different quantum field theories uh, uh, out there. Also related to this question, if the peaks are Lagrangian theories, then these valleys you can think of as being some very strongly coupled regime, which are very rich and very interesting with all sorts of interesting physics dynamics um, that's there, but it could be very hard to access if you're starting out from the top, for example. So most people who work on quantum field theories these days, somewhere in the back of their mind, have this sort of complicated uh, picture of, of what quantum field theory should look like. However, this doesn't, of course, end here. Aspen is one place with its own set of mountains and its own set of tracks and, and, and paths. You also have the Himalayas, which are even more complicated and even more interesting. You have much more uh, rugged uh, sort of peaks to describe much, even, much more complicated and scary quantum field theories that can exist out there, where even the tools, the Lagrangian tools that we have, you have to push quite hard to be able to learn about those families of quantum field theories. You have, for example, the Swiss Alps, again, which have a very different set of tracks which exist out there, 
and a very different topography to describe another class of, of, of quantum field theory. And all of these things are, of course, disconnected, so you can have islands and disconnected uh, set vectors of quantum field theory. So even if this is what you can do with, with, with Lagrangians, it's with standard tools that, we, that, that, that exist where we even barely are able to scratch what we can do, of course, the problem becomes even more complicated when you realize that there are mountain peaks in the oceans all over the place where there are all sorts of myths that live there and a much more scary sort of a regime of, of, of peaks. And understanding sort of those objects basically the standard nice vistas of picture that we can take do not work. You need new tools. You need to have new methods that go beyond this Lagrangian to just understand these larger, more complicated um, uh, sectors of, of quantum field theory. And in, again, in this picture, most, ocean, most sort of mountain ranges are in oceans. Um, and we have much harder way of accessing those and understanding how to describe them. And we need very different set of tools to just understand, uh, to study mountain ranges in, in deep within the ocean. So this, so this is a sort of a new perspective that, that you need to even start to understand these other sectors of quantum field theories, these other strongly coupled regimes of quantum field theories for and for all purposes, are all may govern maybe may govern a, a, a large part of this space than actually the what we used to to, to think about and, and to describe. Okay, so to do this, we sort of uh, I'll go into this geometric classification story now, um, and then I'll finish. Uh, we sort of zoom out a bit on what we want. Uh, what we think about CFTs, we have to appreciate the fact that CFTs also exist in different dimensions of, of space and time. Uh, for example, in, in less than 4D, we know of many examples. There are minimal models. There are examples in critical systems and condensed matter systems. Uh, we can construct some using supersymmetry. We can construct some using holography. At d equal to 4, the known examples are supersymmetric. So supersymmetry has been very important in just understanding conformal field theories. Um, the, there is a famous uh, n equal to four super Yang Mills, which is the most symmetric quantum field theory out there. There is a family of n equal to two conformal field theories, which are described by fabric written theory. There is n equal to one super QCD, which has been very useful in just understanding quantum field theories that are could be much closer to world with no supersymmetry. There is a Wolfson fish, fish to fixed points, which are perturbative, and, there, and, that, and that is a very small class. You can go to five and six dimensions of space time. There, we can only construct supersymmetric examples, and all of those examples are obtained in some way by, by thinking about string theory and thinking about decoupling limits of, 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 of string theory. Um, Moreover, it's even more interesting that if we go to six dimension, you can actually prove six dimension is the highest dimension where you can have an interacting supersymmetric uh, conformal field theory. In dimensions higher than six, supersymmetric interacting conformal field theories are actually not possible. This is a representation theory, theory statement. So, so also one of the more generic things is that conformal field theories in higher dimensions are inherently strongly coupled, and many of them are isolated in a sense that they don't even have parameters that you can use to deform the theory and move around in a landscape to go to different uh, uh, conformal field theories in five and six dimensions. Okay, so one thing that you can do, however, is that you can think about deformations that break the Lorentz symmetry in six dimensions. It can break the Lorentz symmetry in six dimensions and preserve the Lorentz symmetry for a lower dimensional theory. Um, what this means is that you can have RG flows across dimensions. You can take a 6D conformal field theory, you can do a deformation and you can set off an RG flow where you end up to a quantum field theory which lives in lower dimensions, in this case, four dimensions. And this have been, could be a very useful perspective 
in, in, in studying for these conformal field theories. You can think about set starting from some 6D CFT and then reducing down. Um, these, CFT, these, these sort of uh, RG flows that go from six to four, they can describe both CFTs with Lagrangian or CFTs with no Lagrangian. In many cases, you find many new classes of CFTs which are strongly coupled and also isolated. Um, so, so reducing 6D CFTs on 2D spaces can provide an organizing principle to study and define the space of 4D uh, CFTs. To put a, a little bit of meat on this is to, to think of the, the following way. 2D, CF, 2D spaces can be organized topologically by the number of handles that they have and the number of holes that they have on them. So when you take a single six-dimensional superconformal field theory and you reduce it to, onto one of these surfaces with some number of handles and some number of holes, you can construct infinite families of 4D CFTs because you can have infinite choices of 2D spaces which are distinct and infinite choices of 2D spaces with different number of holes on them. And on each hole, you have to sort of give me a boundary condition for the six dimensional theory. And that boundary condition goes into defining what your four dimensional informal field theory would look like. Now, one of the nice things about having 2D spaces and defining using 2D spaces to define your conformal field theory is because 2D spaces have a natural building block element to them. You can take this primitive surface, which is a three punctured sphere, also a pair of pants, and you can glue two pair of pants to create a handle, and you can glue two pair of pants in, in, in other ways to, to create some, some other, other beast. Over here, the holes are exactly these punctures that you have here. So what this now allows you, it allows you to have a new notion of building block of four-dimensional conformal field theory. You can take these pair of pants for each hole, you can demand some boundary condition for a given 6D CFT. And what that gives you, gives you a building block for a 4D quantum field theory. And then once you have these, you can then glue them together in infinitely many different ways. You can glue them together to construct infinitely many different sort of objects, geometries, and each one of these geometries would be representative of a specific choice of a, of a conformal field theory. So in this picture, interactions that we think about, such as gauging or adding forces, exactly correspond to uh, gluing two tubes along this way, or for example, along this way. So the possible ways that you can glue these building blocks with a given set of boundary conditions tell you the different ways you can construct the conformal field theory. The simplest of these guys correspond to actually what we usually think of as free fields, the fields that we use to construct Lagrangian theories. However, for each choice of free field that you can construct, there is an infinite power of additional objects that, that exist, which cannot be described by a Lagrangian itself. So this sort of an approach, due to Gaeta Mornitsky about 10 years ago, has sort of opened up a whole new arena of, of, of how we study and think about quantum field theory in general. But if we want a complete classification, then we, 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 we need to think more carefully. So we, we, the claim is then if you want to classify 4D CFTs, you start with 5D and 6D CFTs and think about all the different ways you can reduce them onto Riemann surfaces and build and construct those building blocks that we just defined. So if this is your scheme, you would like to know whether there is a classification of these 5D and 6D CFTs themselves. And indeed, this is, has been a very exciting research program where since already, so the 5D and 6D CFTs, these are constructed and obtained by taking some string theory and going to a decoupling limit where you forget about gravity and then obtain some 5D or 6D conformal field theory. So by using string theory, we can study the classification program of 5D and 6D CFTs. And then if we have such a classification program of 5D and 6D CFTs, 
then we can sort of use that to try to obtain a classification program of 4D CFTs. And again, to remind you, going through this arrow, every choice of a 6D CFT doesn't imply just a single 4D CFT, it implies infinite choices of families of 4D CFT. So each one of these arrow, you get a much richer and richer and richer, more complex space of objects to think about, okay? You could also consider thinking about string theory and going directly from string theory and looking for ways to decouple gravity and then obtain 4D CFTs. So this also allows you to obtain other approaches of constructing 4D CFTs. So between in this sort of a closure map, this is how we hope in, in, in recent times to try to understand and classify four-dimensional conformal string theory. And of course, you should ask the question, is this sort of a classification scheme that uses string theory in this particular way complete? Um, and one way you can try to answer that is by asking whether all solutions to the bootstrap equations that define conformal field theory come from some, some, some string theory. That is a much, much harder problem. And this is a problem, uh, hopefully, at some point, it will be solvable. Uh, it, will, it certainly requires new ideas. However, this chain of reasoning here is very fruitful and very bountiful, and we can construct many families of conformal field theory that we couldn't imagine any, in, in any other way. And this allows us to explore very novel dynamics of quantum systems, which we couldn't uh, obtain in, in, in other ways. Okay, so to end this with string theory and the landscape, uh, thinking about the landscape of quantum field theory, the picture you should have in mind is if these isolated mountain ranges are some families of quantum field theory. By using string theory, we can sort of explore this larger landscape where you have all sorts of jagged, isolated objects, all sorts of weird monsters and demons that live deep down in the sea. You have all sorts of trenches that exist and ridges in the ocean, which are harder to explore. But with, by starting from a more top-down string theory way, we have tools, we can develop to systematically approach and study these, 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 these questions. So I will end with some string theory propaganda and some really nice uh, model of the Earth. So, thank you, and, 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 and stay safe, and you can take questions. Thank you, Ibu. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. Are there anybody? Um, please raise your hand using the little hand button. See, there's a question here from Paul Frampton. Uh, I've unmuted yeah. you. You should be able to speak. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, thank you for the interesting classification. I wonder if you could make any comments about the existence of four dimensional conformal theories which have no supersymmetry. Good. So this is a harder question. And currently, we, we, we haven't even started to figure out how to chart those things. But certainly, one thing that we know is that there are non supersymmetric deformations that exist for all of the theories that we can write down. So the question is, with, with, of course, what supersymmetry allows you is to, it gives you protected sectors that you can track. And then by tracking those protected sectors, you're able to say something uh, about the long range physics. But once you start breaking supersymmetry, um, you don't have that protection anymore. So it's harder to know what to trust. But it is certainly something, something we can do. There are new ideas currently being explored on how to systematically do deformations of, of, of that, break that break supersymmetry and try to say something about this. One way to sort of think about this is that um, you should, if you have a conformal field theory, they can have many sort of interesting uh, uh, global symmetries of various kinds. And these global symmetries, thinking about them in general, can provide you with additional sort of control on, on, on exploring the, 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 the theory. And in particular, the thing that allows you there is you can think about the anomalies associated with these conformal field theories. And because when you break, when you do a deformation, 
because it's a continuous thing, it doesn't destroy the anomaly. So you can try to use the anomalies to control the non supersymmetric series and at least try to see whether you can partially classify them. But we're very far from even asking the question in a very meaningful way, other than anomaly. More questions. Can we get some more raised hands? We got a question from John Schwartz. John, go ahead. Oh, oh hi, that's a great talk. Thank you. Uh, you. You've discussed routes to conformal field theories that ultimately come from string theory. Mm -hmm. And this gives you theories that can be consistently coupled to gravity. But we also know that there are quantum field theories that cannot be consistently coupled to gravity. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Uh, good. So, so this, this, this. So, so there is a distinction here, right? So, we, when we say that we have a quantum field theory that we cannot couple to gravity, it means we cannot turn on gravity. But, for example, if you have brain setups, right? On brains, you can construct an arbitrary quantum field theory that you want, right? But there isn't a question whether you can couple such a quantum field theory with the standard way of just taking the stress tensor and then coupling it to the background thing. So string theory have defect objects. And when you think about the theory that live on those defect objects with our quantum field theories without gravity. Did that answer your question? Yes, that's a good answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a raised hand from Noah. Go ahead. Noah, are you there? You have to unmute yourself. Good morning, Henrietta. Good morning, Ibra. Good morning. The, the, the ladder starts uh, with string theory. It ends in 4D with 6D in the middle, or 5, 5D or 6D in the middle. We have a, a, a rich scheme in 2D. And what, ah, one of the... Yeah, one of the topics in 2D that I wanted, I wanted to raise, see if you, if you thought about it, and maybe uh, get some discussion, is about this recent development, uh, maybe you're familiar with Uber Salur's work at USC in the past, I don't know, 20 years, starting from supersymmetric conformal field theories in 2D and finding examples where the, the, the central charge, the measure of the conformal anomaly that you just you, you were kind of alluding to a moment ago, where they vanish. And I'm wondering if, uh, if you thought about how to lift the, that kind of uh, phenomenon uh, up into the, the 40 case. So I haven't thought about those specific models on, or, or how, to, how to lift them, um, but they're, they're, they're certainly quite interesting. So the, but one, one way to sort of add this is the, the sort of models so far where we have control, where we can say very, very meaningful things is models that have some, 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 some supersymmetry. When you go down to 2D, of course, there's many models of, of conformal field theory that we can construct without supersymmetry, and there's many fun and interesting things that 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 that. that, that no, no, no. So it's, it's indeed, it's a it's a very so in my talk I stopped at 40, and and that's not a, by accident. That's not that's because once you start to go to 3D and 2D, the zoo is much larger. You have much wilder beasts that you would try to understand and to control. For many of these, we're starting to know how to embed them into this sort of geometric engineering. Um, but for many of them, of course, we actually need new ideas, new paradigms on how we, how, how we obtain these things to, to, to get them. This is, this, was, this is indeed a very good question when you start to go to mind. Just want not, not to introduce a new paradigm, but uh, I'm trying to raise the, the topic. There are supersymmetric conformal field theories in two dimensions that have this phenomenon of uh, vanishing central charge. So, of course, there are many non-set supersymmetric conformal field theories in any dimension. But in two dimensions, uh, Hubert and others have studied this. Uh, Victor Garari and, and Boulder, closer to Aspen, for example, have looked at this question of, well, what, what if we are willing to relax unitarity? As you know, in two dimensions, there's this famous classification for central charge less than one due to catch that shows that there's, there's none with um, there's no unitary CFT, supersymmetric or not, with central charge zero. But it turns out there are some um, even supersymmetric ones that have central charge zero, and they seem to be uh, perhaps relevant for, for the non-local phenomena we're interested in when thinking about gravity. 
So I, 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 I haven't studied them, so I don't know how I could say how they could be embedded in string theory or not. But even within string theory, um, some of the more recent developments that we've had, you can see through the CFTs, which have, for example, negative central charge, these appear when you look at high dimensional uh, CFTs, and then you can sort of carve out sectors through some, for example, Kyle algebras, which, and then those sectors will have some description in terms of some 2D model, and those 2D models can have negative central charge. But these specific examples I haven't studied, so I, I, don't, I don't think I can comment on how I can embed them. All right, we had a, we had a question from Leo, a raised hand. Leo, did you want to ask? Your hand disappeared. Sure, I'll ask a question. Uh, I guess uh, much of the talk was, has focused on Lorentz invariant theories, uh, if I understand correctly, but mm -hmm. there's a much broader class of field theories that we study that appear in condensed matter physics, where let's say spontaneously you break spatial symmetries. Yeah. Where, you know, they're described by critical points, infrared attractive critical points where, uh, you know, you have anisotropy in the, you know, the, the a critical point is, is intrinsically anisotropic. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, yeah, one spatial direction scales differently than other spatial directions. So, Good. Do, you, do you, are you familiar at all with those? And I, I suppose yeah. they just don't fit into the no, uh, so high energy. They, so. they, they do. First, you should note that when we go to 6D to 4D, we are breaking Lorentz invariant. Okay. So, so, in fact, you know, the, the, the thing that underlies this program is, is exactly understanding the different ways you can break Lorentz invariants and somehow be able to control the system. Okay. So this is why we can flow from across dimensions, as, as, you, just, as you just point out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but, the, the, but the point that you're saying is that you want to still look at, for example, 4D systems, which are critical, but do not have the full Lorentz symmetry, but have other, other sort of symmetry. So those sort of models we can study and, and, and explore in, in the context of holography, for example. Right. In the context of, of holography and ADS-CFT, we can certainly explore low energy models which do not preserve the full Lorentz symmetry, but preserve something, something smaller that we would like to study. So, so these, in these models, do you, are the, are the spatial symmetry broken spontaneously or explicitly? I, so the, so the models that I am familiar with, these are sort of models where you have a low energy limit where you have some Lipschitz symmetry right. that emerge. So in right. those cases, in, uh, along the holographic flow that you construct, um, I, I think both exist where you have a, a sort of explicit deformations that break the Lipschitz symmetry, or you can have the Lipschitz symmetry itself emerge down in the IR, where you would imagine that's breaking somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. I'm not the expert on this, uh, but I can certainly refer you to, 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 to some people. I think I saw Cindy Keeler was here, and Cindy worked on some of those models uh, at, at some point. Um, um, yeah, but, but certainly those things we can explore, um, but you have to sort of widen your, your, your bag. You, you know, so, so here I only describe one framework where you take the quantum field theory in, six, in higher dimensions and you, you, you compactify it to get a lower dimensional thing. A whole nother sort of avenue of studying quantum field theory is using holography via the ads cfp mechanism. There, you, 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 you're solving for quantum field theory by solving Einstein's equation in some space with a negative cosmological constant. So in those cases, you can explicitly see deformations that break the Lorentz symmetry, and you can ask what sort of uh, low energy uh, space-time symmetry you can get, and you can get much richer classes uh, uh, there, but I didn't have time to talk about this. Yeah, I guess in, I, I guess the type of theories I'm referring to, the appear in condensed matter physics, are systems in which spatial symmetries are broken spontaneously. So you really, what I'm really talking about is not a critical point, but uh, a, a 
you know, a, a, a fixed point and a track, infrared attractive fixed point that describes not a, not a critical point, meaning not a, a point of transition between two phases, yeah. but actually a whole phase of matter. So there, there's a kind of a, an array of theories, field theories, which where the ordered phase, some spontaneously broken ordered phase mm -hmm. is described by a non-trivial infrared attractive fixed point, non-Gaussian fixed point. So mm -hmm. the, what we're usually used to in kind of Lorentz invariant theories is that the Gaussian fixed point in the phase is attractive, is stable mm -hmm. for some range of parameters. But uh, there's a class of field theories in which uh, uh, Gaussian fixed point, the phase is described by a non-trivial non -trivial infrared attractive fixed point. And often those are uh, anisotropic fixed points, but they're not, they don't appear as a result of some perturbation that breaks spatial symmetry, but they appear spontaneously, like your ordered phase spontaneously decides to choose yeah, one I, axis over the other axis. Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, your, your, your question, right? So this is, so in the context of, of sort of holographic systems, what you have is that you're, you, you have a, you have a, you have a space time, which is, which is ADS in this case. Um, and, and there is a map between sort of the gravitational degrees of freedom and the boundary quantum field theory degrees of freedom. So in those cases, you have a UV where the UV is basically near the boundary of the space, which is something. Mm -hmm. And then you consider some solution with that fixed boundary condition, right? And then you ask, what are the solutions that you can mm -hmm. What you can do, there are solutions that exist where, where at the boundary, you have some ADS-like things, which means that the UV theory preserves some, some Lorentz symmetry. Mm -hmm. But as you go down, um, basically there are, the asymptotic behavior of the metric, the asymptotic behavior of the other field is such that inside the space, they pick up non-trivial background values. And then when you go to the low energy, you have new systems which basically exhibit different uh, uh, space-time symmetry, which is not, which is smaller than the one that you started. I see. Okay, very so, interesting. So, so morally, you think of as being spontaneous, be spontaneously broken because the boundary theory where which where things are starting off is is, is itself um, preserved Lorentz. I see. Okay. Well, thank you. So we have a question in the chat now to Ibo. Uh, so the question is: Can you explain how a quantum field theory can lack a Lagrangian description, ah, and do good. such theories also lack Hamiltonians? Um, no. Or is there some abstraction in passing to a Lagrangian, or is it not even a Hamiltonian? Is the question. So the, the first question, the first thing to address, what do you mean by having a Lagrangian? By writing down a Lagrangian means that I have a description in terms of free weakly coupled objects, right? I have a description in terms of, let's say, free fields of, that I can make precise in some way. In quantum field theory, there is a very precise definition of what you mean by a free, free field. So if you have a landscape of quantum field theory, it could be that as you, as you basically move around that landscape of quantum field theory, there is no point where you have one of the parameters of the quantum field theory be small enough that you can define the notion of the free field. So, it, so, so, so that is certainly a logical possibility which can happen and, and, and it exists. You have to adapt a more sort of general definition of what I mean by quantum field theory. The best thing you, you should talk, the thing you should, talk about is the partition function, right? Even when you have a Lagrangian, the same quantum system can admit many different sorts of Lagrangians that flow to it, right? So the notion of a Lagrangian itself is a, is, is a sort of a, um, uh, um, uh, you, it, it, if you have it, you can say a lot, but it's not necessary to define a quantum field theory, right? So what we want, we want to have a non-perturbative definition of quantum field theory, not a weakly coupled definition of quantum field theory. So the thing you always should think about is the partition function and how the partition function depends on the generators of various operators that live in the quantum field theory. I can certainly hand you a, a partition function from which I cannot write down a Lagrangian or even a Hamiltonian to, 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 to get that object. Do you want to comment more on the Hamiltonian part of the question? 
sorry, repeat the Hamiltonian part of the question. The question is, do such theories lack Hamiltonians or is there some obstruction in passing to a Lagrangian or not even a Hamiltonian? The thing that, 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 that exists in the quantum field theory that you should describe is the stress energy density. So a local quantum field theory, even whether Lagrangian or not, has a well-defined notion of a, of, a, of a stress energy. Let me see, are there other questions? I don't see any other hands. Um, I'll ask a question then. Um, Ibu, it's a colloquium speaker type of question. Uh, if students, postdocs hear your talk, what is your advice to them? What is my advice to them? Oh, um, look for weird things and go after them. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I mean, if, if, if you're a student, you, you, you sort of appreciate that, um, you know, especially the current state of, of high energy physics, there aren't sort of a, you know, a global sort of goal on, on things to do. You know, the old questions that when I was a student that were thought to be the most important questions aren't so much the thing to think about. The questions, you know, when I was started in string theory, I was driven by the exoticness notion of, 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 of unification of, of everything. But you soon realize that, that 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 dream, that sort of idea is much, much harder and, and, it, and it's much less precise of a notion. But, but then you realize that there are many interesting questions out there. And um, there are many interesting holes to sort of go in and, and, and follow through. This is, from that point of view, this is actually a rather interesting time in physics because there isn't a singular goal for all of higher energy physics. This is the problem we have to solve. We are in an era where we need to find new directions of research and new ideas to, to, to explore. So if you're a student, it's actually sort of a great because in some way you are in the same boat as the, your faculty advisor or as the most senior person in the field. No one really knows what we should be doing next or what the question we should be doing things. And you sort of have to come up with it and figure it out. So this is a question, of course, that I've been realizing the last 10 years or so. And you know, so you go out there and find things to look for. You should look for weird things. Weird things are the things that's going to lead to new physics, not the same things that every, everyone has been saying and, and, and doing. So that would be my, my advice to a young student or a postdoc. Thank you, Ibu. Uh, I don't see any other hands. Um, so I think we should thank Ibu again for the great talk and for the good advice. And it's great to see you and see many others, familiar names on this list of people. Um, tune in next week again for the next Aspen Colloquium. And I will finish up on that note and wish everybody well. Stay safe out there. Thank you.